um, which will be uh, Abbas Genia from Universal Michigan. And um, let me see, yeah, Abbas is a second year graduate student of uh, Professor Sarah Posey. Um, his presentation will be validation of artificial neural network systems for neutron detection in a mixed neutron photon environment. Go ahead, Abbas, if you are ready. Thank you, Professor He. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Professor He mentioned, I'm a Bas Genia, finishing my second year PhD under Professor Posey at the University of Michigan. Today, I will present on the validation of artificial neural network systems for neutron detection in a mixed neutron photon environment. We have the biggest national security challenge of detecting special nuclear material, SNM. Currently, we rely on passive detection systems, which could provide false negatives if the SNM is appropriately shielded. An alternative to passive detection is to use active methods. Active interrogation methods uses an ionizing radiation to induce nuclear reactions in the nuclear materials because we know that special nuclear materials will fission upon interrogation, identification becomes possible through fission signatures. Recent technological advances in um, medical linear accelerators, LINAX, has enabled us to use Bremsstrahlung radiation for active interrogation applications. At the University of Michigan, we are researching to use Telbene organic scintillators and commercially available medical LINAX for active interrogation applications. Still being is a state-of-the-art detector that is sensitive to both neutrons and photons. These detectors have excellent pulse shape discrimination capability as shown in the figure. However, the ability of still being detectors to simultaneously detect photons and neutrons can possess great challenges in scenarios where one radiation type is significant than the other, such as photon-induced active interrogation. In photon-based active interrogation scenario, pulse pile-up is of serious issue. These pile-up pulses are created due to intense photon field. Accurately estimating neutron count rates using traditional charge integration becomes crucial because piled up pulses increases the probability of particle misclassification. It also creates a very distinct cloud on the PSD plot. Traditionally, what one would do is use a discrimination line between the neutron and photon cloud to classify um, new, to differentiate neutrons from the photons. In this pulse pileup scenario, all of the double pulse will be classified as neutrons. The another serious concern, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have is quantifying neutron production rate in the surrounding materials. Energetic photons can result in photonuclear reactions in the surrounding materials. For example, lead which is a commonly used shielding material, can emit photoneutrons when interrogated with a 9 MeV endpoint Bremsstrahlung source. Photoneutrons are monoenergetic, whereas fission neutrons are emitted with a spectrum of energy. For SNM detection, fission neutrons are of typical interest. In order to address the pulse pileup issue and high confidence detection of fission neutrons, in a photon-based active interrogation scenario, we developed an artificial neural network. The network identifies photon, neutron, and piled up pulses, and attempts to recover individual pulses from piled up. The current ANN system works in two phases. In phase one, the neural network classifies pulses as photon, neutron, or piled up. In phase two, the network attempts to recover individual pulses from piled up pulses. For our purposes, we split up piled up pulses into three categories, close, split, 
and cut. Each face of the neural network has 15 neurons. The neutron and photon pulses are identified through their differences in pulse shape. A close pulse is a type of piled up pulse in which the second peak occurs within 140 nanoseconds of the acquisition window. In a split pulse, the second maximum occurs after 140 nanoseconds of the acquisition window. A cut pulse is the one in which the second peak occurs after 270 nanoseconds of the acquisition window. We cannot recover the second pulse in a cut type piled up due to missing tail information. Before we can use the network for any real applications, we have to train the network. We train the neural network using data collected from a spontaneous fission source, Californium-252. Californium emits photons and neutrons over wide energy range. Using high confidence neutron and photon single pulses, close, split, and cut types of piled up pulses were synthesized. All possible combinations of photon neutron piled up were synthesized. The trained network was then tested against a alpha N source, that is a PUBI source. And we see that both charge integration methods and neural network showed similar particle classifications. After acquiring confidence in the training of the network, we test the ability of the neural network to perform in a LINAC-like scenario. An experiment was set up with the neutron source, that is Californium-252, and three gamma check sources. The gamma sources used in this measurements are sodium-22, cesium-137, and cobalt-60. The distance between the neutron source and the detector is fixed at 80 centimeter. The gamma sources are brought closer to the detector in gradual steps. This increases the photon field as gamma sources move closer to the detector, creating LINAC-like scenario. For all distances of gamma sources from the detector, the data was processed through traditional charge integration methods and a neural network. Percent neutron, percent photon, and percent piled up are determined using equation one shown on the slide. All the data is processed at 50 millivolt threshold, which is equivalent to 70 keV EE light output. That is equivalent to about 0.7 MeV neutron energy. First, let's consider the neutron classification plot to the left of the screen. We see that both traditional charge integration and neural network show nearly constant neutron count rate. One thing that we see from this plot is the non-official neural network has higher neutron rates than traditional charge integration methods. Traditional charge integration methods rely on discrimination line, as I mentioned earlier, to differentiate neutrons from the photons. So depending on the line, one can classify, one could end up misclassifying photons as neutrons or neutrons are photons, and therefore it is, you, may get, you may end up getting a fewer neutron count rate. On the other hand, the neural network solely relies on the pulse shape. There is no discrimination line. Um, be, because the neutron source is always at a fixed distance from the detector, the neutron count rate is expected to stay constant because that's the only source of neutron in our measurement. Next, we consider the gamma classification to the right of the screen. We see that the gamma count rate is increasing with decreased source, gamma source to detector distance. This is to be expected since the photon field is increasing with decreased gamma distance from the detector. Let's consider the piled up pulses now. In traditional charge integration methods, piled up pulses are not used in the final result. The piled up pulses could lie anywhere above the neutron cloud on the PSD plot as shown earlier. 
depending on how close the two peaks in the piled up pulses are, the neural network tries to recover individual pulses and attempts to reclassify them. From the figure on the right, one thing to note that the artificial neural network eliminates a fewer pulses than traditional charge integration methods. This is something that can be of great advantage in a LINAC active interrogation scenario. In conclusion, the network has demonstrated its ability to successfully classify singles from the piled up pulses. The network has been successful in differentiating neutrons from the photons. The network has also demonstrated its robustness against sources with different energy spectrum a fission source versus an alpha end source. And lastly, artificial neural network eliminates fewer pulses than traditional charge integration methods. This can help improve statistics on the neutron count rate during an active interrogation scenario. In future, we plan on making the artificial neural network independent to the gain of the photomultiplier tube. Currently, our network is trained on a single PMT gain setting. If a new gain setting is desired, then the network would need to be retrained, which will require new training data altogether. We also plan on implementing the network on the FPGA of the digitizer. This will allow for real-time classification of the detected signal. MTV impact. The MTV has given me the opportunity to talk about neural networks through to the young engineers through MTV summer school program. In terms of project development, uh, we would like to test our neural network systems in a photon based active interrogation scenario with some real SNM. Uh, because medical Linux are commercially available are not very expensive. Uh, once successful, we believe that the LINAC and still beam detectors can help us to develop an economical active interrogation detection systems. Currently, um, the active interrogation detection systems that are available uses um, accelerators such as rototrons, and these accelerators are very expensive. Additionally, real-time processing of the data can help save time when interrogating cargo containers at the ports of entry. With that, I conclude my presentation. I would like to extend my gratitude to MTV, NNSA, and the Department of Energy. Thank you, and I will take questions now. Thank you, Abbas, um, for your interesting presentation. I see uh, two questions. Uh, the first one, um, uh, they ask you, uh, when you say the uh, ANN solely relies on pulse shape, what exactly does that mean? Um, what sort of properties or parameters of the pulse um, does the ANN look at? Uh, that is a very interesting question. So I'm going to go back. So when we look at the neutron and photon pulse, um, first thing is these are normalized pulses. So clearly we can see that a neutron has a more tail or it has um, more area in the tail of the pulse than the photon. So when we are training the network, uh, what this is the feature of the pulse that we use. So we take some high confidence neutron pulses these high confidence neutron pulses were extracted using the time of flight setup. And we tell the neutron that this, we tell the network that this is what a neutron looks like. So in terms of input to the network, what we give is the samples of the pulse to the network. The network will then uh, uh, do this normalization and look at the template or uh, the pulse shape of a trained neutron. And based on that, it is going to decide whether it's a neutron or a photon. Hmm. Thank you. Um, so fundamentally, there is no um, difference between the tail and total ratio, 
kind of depend on how you see, how you look at it, right? Mm, yes. Um, fundamentally, yes. It is yeah. still kind of comparing the tail value of the pulse. Yeah. Um, and that second question is, could you describe what the loss function entailed for optimizing the parameters in the A ANN? In other words, what quantity metric was used to inform the training? Uh, if I understand this question correctly, mm -hmm. um, does he, does the, is it pertaining to on what basis do I decide that my network is optimized? Or the question is related to how, what kind of input is to the network? Is, this is where I'm kind of confused. Yeah, Tony, Shin, um, if you are online, you can explain your question. I wasn't sure too, um, what, what uh, was your question? Hi, yeah, Bob. Free. Can you hear Hi, me? Hi, Tony. Yes, I can hear you. That's a nice talk. I was just curious, uh, when you train a neural network, typically uh, you, you tweak the parameters uh, within each node based on some metric. Usually it's root mean squared error of your um, test set or things like that. I was wondering what quantity or what metric kind of dictated what the overall optimized network was. Oh, duh. So Tony, to answer that question, um, right now, as I said in this presentation, that in phase one and phase two of the neural network, we are using 50 neurons. These neurons are arbitrary right now. In like currently, as we speak, we are working towards optimizing these number of neurons because we don't wanna use additional information in our network because that will simply increase our computation and it is not gonna serve us any advantage in terms of processing it. So we have not fully optimized the network. We are working towards the full optimization of the network. Thank you. Um, uh, Tony, is that answer your question? Oh, thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, what are the classes that the ANN can output? So, okay. Oops, I'm gonna go. So in phase one, we get three types of uh, classes, neutron pulses, photon pulses, and piled up pulses. Uh, so anything that's not a neutron or a photon gets classified as piled up in phase one. Um, and then piled up are, kind of split into these three categories. And these definitions are something that we found to re, like redefine, we told the network that this is what a close split and a cut pulse will look like. Uh, and then, yeah, so these are the broad categories of classes that the ANN can output. Uh, just to, uh, for clarification, you, you wrote on this slide, gamma N and N gamma, can the, the network differentiate which particle comes in first, gamma first and neutron later or? Yes, so oh. when we trained the network, we used mm. our high confidence um, singles pulses that we acquired through time of flight. And we kind of synthesized these different combinations of piled up. Uh, so when, uh, when the network sees a close type of piled up, if the two peaks are well separated, it will try to further reclassify them as a gamma gamma kind of a piled up or mm. a gamma neutron kind of a piled up, so on and so forth. Interesting, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, can this technology reconstruct multiple single pulses from a piled up pulse? That is, again, a very interesting question. So to answer this question, um, it depends on how close the two peaks are. For example, in case of a cut type pulse, um, that is right here, uh, we cannot recover the second pulse. Um, we can't reconstruct it back or we can't recover because there's missing information. But we can get the first pulse with um, nice confidence. And with the closed pulse, um, it again depends 
in case of a split pulse, the two, both the pulses can be recovered because the peaks are well separated. But in case of a closed pulse, again, it depends how close the two peaks are. Because if the tail information is missing for the first pulse, we can't recover the first, but we can recover the second. Mm. Are there other questions from the audience? You can post down the chat. Uh, if not, let me ask a, a, a very general question. I'm always curious on this uh, neural network. So imagine you could uh, still use the traditional pulse shape discrimination. It may not be just the, the tail versus total, but you can, like, uh, if you normalize, you can uh, calculate the slope, whatever that is. What I'm saying is, uh, instead of neural network, network, you still use digital signal processing to get some parameters on the gamma and neutron and separate them. But when you have a mixed signal, you you know the parameter is somewhere in between. And uh, so my question is, what what special about neural network does? Is there something that you cannot do with the digital signal process and traditional digital signal process? Um, so one of the biggest motivation for us uh, developing this neural network is we wanted to do something on board the digitizer. Um, so say, for example, you're right, Professor, nowadays digitizer has the capability of doing pulse shape discrimination. Mm. Um, I have uh, uh, with this network, what we're trying to do is we not only give you, we not only output neutron or photon, we can also output the energy spectrums that we get from the classified pulses. Uh, so say we, we have a new, so the network classified all neutron pulses. Uh, we know what the amplitude or things of that is already there and all that information gets saved Mm. while it's processing it. Uh, so we can construct the energy spectrum from that information. That's one point. The second point that uh, I think that this has a great advantage in using real times is my biggest issue of pulse pileup. When I am doing an active interrogation kind of a scenario experiment with a LINAC and a target, I get so much of this double piled up and in traditional charge integration methods, if I were to rely on tail versus total, I end up throwing these pulses. I don't recover any information from that. Uh, but if I have a network which is trained for different types of piled up with different combinations of neutron photon, I can get some additional information from the pulses that are eliminated. And this is where I see the biggest strength of an artificial neural network. Thank you, interesting. Maybe I can learn from you later <laughs> in our department. Because uh, uh, I, I thought that the digital signal processing could also, when the power up increases, you can adjust something that to try to fit in general. Uh, but but uh, if I may, I, I, bring, uh, I, I have a, another general um, question which is, um, does the training uh, depend on the ratio of gamma and neutron signals? What I'm, what, where I'm getting at is that uh, if you train in a real practical application, does, uh, does the object influence your training? That's what my question. So if you, you, uh, if you, if you do the uh, activation analysis on a smaller object or a truck or a, 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 a package, does that change? What, what my question is, does your training have to involve the object? You see my question? No, no, no. So we don't have, so we don't need a real life uh, active interrogation experiment to train the network. Mm. We can train the network once and then it will do the job of classifying neutron and photon. And uh, so a neural network can be thought of as a two, branches where one part involves the training of the network and one part is evaluation of the network. The evaluation is related to the training, but training has nothing to do with evaluation. So training doesn't need any information from evaluation, but evaluation mm -hmm. needs information from training. 
Um, and training is independent and we train the network where using some high confidence data. And again, these high confidence data is acquired using charge integration methods, but we, these charge integration methods uh, are very, very you know, beneficial or they don't break down for training purposes because we know the certain strength of charge integration. For example, when we increase the energy threshold, the separation between neutron and photon cloud becomes very nice. And in that case, our misclassification rate is almost 0%. Hmm. And things like time of flight, which can give us an additional tag saying that whether it's a neutron or a photon. Does that answer your question, Professor He? Yeah, yeah. There are some comments uh, to share with everybody uh, uh, from uh, Robert Hayes. Uh, um, so he thinks the training is not dependent on the object, but it is dependent on the uh, PMT gain, is that correct? Right now, the network is dependent on the PMT gain, yes. Mm. But we can make it independent to the gain of the PMT. Mm. Um, okay, so with the time, thank you very much, Abbas. That was great uh, talk and uh, good discussion. So thank let's move to much. the, yeah, let's move to the next student. Uh,